Okay, so thanks, Mo, for your usual brevity and um, <laughs> leaving me more than two minutes to, to get through my stuff. So <laughs> and they put me after Mo, that's worse. <laughs> so despite all of the evidence to the contrary, I'm not actually Andrew Trossman. Andrew had to head home today, um, unfortunately. He's actually on an aeroplane, um, so I took over from him. Um, I, I'm, however, still you know, one of Andrew's colleagues with peers in the same organisation, and I'm going to take you through Andrew's material, um, and I hope to be as quick as possible. Now, I know we don't have much time, and I know my computer's not advancing, which is weird. Now, here we go. So that was unexpected. So thank you, Andrew, for putting me in the spot. I'm not rebooting, goodness. Do I have to go first? Before I get this fixed? This is completely stuck. Try that. Why is this not working? <laughs> it worked a second ago. It's, it's plug and play, yeah. No signal? Okay. Technology. <laughs> All right, let me try again. All right, so let's hope that this works. Now this thing is black, but I guess that's fine. Um, I just want to start where the previous uh, presentation has left off. I want to say hello. My name is Frank Schwichtenberg. I'm the technical product owner of IBM Cloud Manager with OpenStack. Uh, we had a variation of this chart before, uh, and what I was, what I'm up to do now is I want to show you some of the implementations of what we have shown, and you may realize some correlation between what we sh do as hardware in a demo. We were discussing a little bit if you should show it to you live or not live, uh, and while live has some authenticity, some of the operations take quite a while, and the video has the advantage that we can time shrink that to value your time. I really invite you to come to our booth uh, and I go through every step that you would like to see live. So I will, straight after this, I will go to the IBM booth and I would be happy to see you. And we can talk about it, we can stop and drill a little deeper than we can here, if that's okay with you. Okay, uh, so unfortunately it's a video. Um, and this is um, IBM Cloud Manager with OpenStack. As we said, it's a full, uh, OpenStack Juno uh, code base that allows you to build a cloud on a premise of your choice. So not only local premises, we have uh, customers that have requirements for multi-premise, uh, be it for multi-location, be it for scalability from an architecture perspective. There are, multi, there are many reasons why you may, may want to have multi-region uh, and, and <coughs> a hybrid-like approach. So the one thing that the team spent quite a bit of time implementing is the ability to serve multi-architecture, multi-hypervisor environments. Uh, and I don't know any other company that presses that to that degree like we do. To an example here, we have a REST region here, which does OpenStack on x86. We have the South region, which is uh, pretty unique. It's a legacy VMware uh, situation, let me slow that down, that allows you coexistence uh, between uh, a, a traditional VMware deployment 
that you may want to drive or you, you used to drive with VCAG or other means uh, and you want to have your entry to OpenStack cloud management, you can use this self-service user interface that we add as optional value add and basically get a visual integration, single pane of glass. So you see your VMware stuff and you see your, open, your emerging OpenStack uh, ecosystem being combined in a one sing single pane of glass, which I think is pretty powerful. Uh, in addition, we have um, OpenStack on ZVM. So things that used to be not very accessible for the, let's say, younger talents that may not have the skills of mainframe can now use the, the, the benefits from quality of service the, of the big iron, let's say, of the, of the mainframe systems. The East region is quite interesting as well because the East region is quite busy because we have Power KVM, which is a very symmetrical stack with Libvirt and KVM but on Power 8 boxes. Beautiful, wonderful architecture, robust. Uh, we like it very much. It's a little engine based from a technical perspective. However, um, as Mo pointed out, there's a rich set of systems of a record solutions available in the uh, Power VM base with AIX and IBM I that our customers would like to introduce with, from a system of record to system of engagement kind of solutions and combine the two. So the Power VC environment that enables that is one of our targets as well and implemented here as well. In addition, we are in our third release to uh, deliver OpenStack for Hyper-V, which uh, offers access to an on-par hypervisor to, to VMware uh, at a very attractive cost base with very compelling features like shared nothing live migration, uh, to just name a few. In addition, we have something which I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, <coughs> IBM Elastic Storage, uh, which is, you may have heard the GPFS term before, which is very popular in, in the high performance computing world as a very robust high performance, low latency file system. And not only you can use that for um, um, <coughs> GLANs, i.e. the shared file system to uh, create mobility in KVM, but you can use it for Cinder and for Swift as well extremely scalable. So the Cinder case, for example, is if the hypervisor needs a volume, it doesn't have to do iSCSI. It screams basically just using um, GPFS-based elastic storage. In addition, elastic storage is so flexible that you can actually create a highly scalable, really large cloud uh, in not requiring a storage server. You can utilize local storage uh, and, and basically uh, create a very high throughput, real good scaling environment. So if, you're, if you have needs like that, um, you probably should validate if that's true for you as well. All right. <coughs> I have a horrible cold, I apologize. Um, so the, the, the self-service user interface um, is giving you access to OpenStack region and to that vCenter. And we map some of the concepts. So for example, the project concept that we offer maps to OpenStack tenants. No surprise here. Well, we, we add value add here. Um, it is a, a feature that we add here that you can, on the region base or on the, on the um, project base, you can set policies like expiration. So you can, for example, say, I want my instances in this project to expire after five days. And I know people won't like it, so they probably want to have an extension. So the policy allows you to specify the extension period maximum that you allow. So let's put that in. So five days, let's say we allow 25 days extension because they're friendly. And because we know people ignore all the warnings and they don't believe that we mean it, we probably should add two days before we actually wipe the resources. So after the, the instances get torn down, we don't quite delete the instances yet, so, so we can still do some recovery. And we do have email notification uh, to, to have appropriate warning. And that is all highly customizable. Another thing is just imagine you're hosting an SAP solution. You have this very empowering self-service user interface. And let's say the user say, I wonder what delete does. And say, oop, it's gone. That would be bad. So many of our customers really, really appreciate the fact that we have the ability to very individually select on and off which operations require approval. Uh, and the approval goes then through the project admin uh, and allows some <laughs> securing of these empowered uh, use cases. Um, so let's talk a little bit about another feature. Uh, so you see images, volume, and instances all 
have a visual federation of all the regions being connected. So let me stop here because it's actually quite interesting. AIX is coming from PowerVC. Um, this is coming from VMware. Um, whatever. You see, it comes from all sorts of spaces. But as a self-service user, you don't care. You can focus on your work, you can focus on your innovation, and the, the complexity of implementation is an implementation detail to you that you can safely ignore in many cases. If not, the cloud admin in the self-service user interface can expose the things that may matter to you in, in, in the way how they configure it. So we, we're trying to do a solid mix here between empowerment and simplification without dumbing down users either. And the customer can really manage and, and, and adjust that. So if you look at the instances, you see a lot. So obviously, we would allow scoping this down to the region as well. You can scope it down on the project that you're working on. You can scope it down on the user. So as a user, you may be in multiple projects, for example. So that does make sense. So let's look, um, let's say, at the West region for now. And we have five Tempest test instances running. And um, let's imagine that we want to instantiate five more. So we go into the Images tab, and uh, after a while, I decide to do that. <laughs> Sorry for that, a little pause here. And, and, and we can basically showcase that with virtually no training, really everybody can do this. It's a very low, task, uh, very low education requirement for the end user. So let's go into the Tempest image that we have in this region, the West region, click on Deploy. And the person who imported this image has made it very easy. So everything is basically pre-configured. And the only thing that you can really set here is a name, which, which project it goes in. We can overwrite the expiration. And we can say how many instances of this image we want. So fire and go. Uh, so now let's say, how about horizon? We obviously feature and serve a full feature horizon that enables all the OpenStack features. So you can select your uh, tenant. You can select your region, which I should have said West region here so that I ran out of time to do that properly. We have um, the host aggregates. And we use that. And we define, let's say, four nodes, CN4 to CN6 here. And this is important for the next thing I'm showing you. Um, one of the value adds is that we have platform resource scheduler that offers placement policies. We talked about that briefly. Uh, which is the initial placement and the runtime placement. Initial placement is the, what happens if you instantiate an instance. The runtime placement is a replacement. Basically, dynamically, the, the, the mix of instances is changing, and you have a policy what, what, the, what the scheduler should do about that, basically by the means of live, live migration. So if you look into that, um, you, you see that we have multiple different policies. It's actually quite powerful. I selected striping here, which means evenly balanced. But you could do CPU load balance, memory load balance, striping as said, packaging, policy, uh, 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 the pack, packing, and CPU utilization. Packing would be an example if you have like a large data center and you are like an emerging cloud and you don't really quite have the utilization yet, maybe you want to pack them all together in, in, in a few hosts and be able to switch off a few hosts to conserve energy. Or maybe this is a power cloud and IBM has this nice feature that you can enable hardware licenses uh, as a software and you, you may not want to pay that. So you basically you scale down the virtual hardware consumption that you have and just use it on a subset. So you're very flexible here to play with your resources. <coughs> okay, remember we had five instances running in West region and I instantiated five more. We have striping defined as the policy for, for placement. So let's look at the hypervisor view here where we see the instances. And over time, uh, they get obviously, I condensed the time here, so I'm honest, uh, they basically get provisioned. Uh, and we expect an even distribution, and you will not be surprised to hear that actually works, and we get a 3-3-4 three, three, or whatever combination out of 10 instances. All right, so let's go down on the command line to uh, make some other cases. So you see here we have a hypervisor status list where you see the HA status and the maintenance status of our three nodes that we care about right now in our scope. 
let's say um, we have a planned maintenance activity. Maybe we need to upgrade the microcode of the Ethernet adapter or the yearly power maintenance uh, thing comes along and you need to do power maintenance on the power line. So you want to be able to take a note down and you want to do that with the least amount of, of impact to your work. So wouldn't it be nice to have a single command to say you are on maintenance and get them all out of the way? That's what you have. You have a command to do, ex to do exactly that. You say migrate all of that node and put it on maintenance mode. That's all you do. Done. So it enters the maintenance mode. You can see that here. Uh, and uh, you can, in, in, in a short moment of time, so you see it entering here, CN4. And you can see in Horizon in the hypervisor view that this actually happens. Uh, so the, the former more instances in CN04 get gradually moved over to the remaining ones. I just, just mention, I should mention something. The reason why this is happening relatively slowly is because there's a policy in place how many migrations you allow at a certain amount of time to not create too much load through all this smartness. So, 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 so there is a slow down basically intentionally created to basically be less impacting in terms of, of your other quality of service. So don't be surprised by that, that it takes like two or few seconds to, to, to kick that in. So at some point you have 5.5. Five. This uh, node now is not, ha not have, having any instances. You see in, in, in a short moment of time that our maintenance status is off on. The screen is not all that great, but believe me, it's on. Uh, which means you can turn off the node uh, and you can perform your maintenance as planned. So now let's say Tipsy Franks comes along, visits the data center, and there was this one Ethernet cable that he didn't see and he trips over it and gets out of the system, which is a catastrophic event, so all the instances on that host would be disconnected. All right, and um, little technology here thing, so you, if you don't understand the details, ignore that. What I basically do here is I, I showcase that you can get onto the node, you can virtually rip out the Ethernet, and through the HA policy that we have, the platform resource scheduler as part of the product realizes that they have to remote restart those instances on remaining nodes in the host aggregate. And uh, let's go through that. Uh, here I just show, okay, that's the, in that's the interface. Uh, uh, we, are, we are still okay. As a, we, we, we can define the policies, obviously, with a remote restart, but this, let, let's ignore that detail. If you have interest, let's talk about that at the booth. I think that would go so far here. But if you now look at um, Horizon, you see we have the five instances on one node and five instances on other node because we have striping, remember? Uh, so now go to the node. We have a serial over LAN console. We really have five instances running right now. And I if config down the interface, which is the equivalent of ripping the Ethernet cable. Uh, so node is gone, boom. I look at Nova, and Nova has a little polling going on. So at first it doesn't see it. A second later it sees, oops, my Nova compute node went away and says, we're down. Now, platform resource scheduler comes in and quickly enters the rebuilding stage, meaning applying the HA policy of, re of remote restart. And you can see here, if you look closely, that the five instances here get restarted here. Mission accomplished, you could say, almost. So here, I want to be honest with you. Um, IBM has a lot of cultural change here. And we're very open <coughs> with continuous delivery and, and, and telling you what we are doing, gathering your feedback and so on. This is good for the catastrophic case. It's excellent. So the thing burns up in smoke, you have a remote restart, your quality of service is higher. For intermittent errors, we're not quite done yet. So we will, at some point, have to introduce effect, uh, a new, an additional feature named shielding, where those instances on that node cannot possibly get back on the network again. So, so we do not create conflicts. So we're not quite done yet on GA time on 4.2, but we will work on that very hard and will come very soon. So it, just as an example of transparency, we give you a feature that's already useful, we say what the limitations are, and we're already hinting that we're working on it to improve that just as a transparency proof point. Okay, that was the, the, the short rundown of the demo. Um, I have actually another plug to make. If I had a network, that would be nice. Um, since URLs, specifically IBM URLs, can be horrible, 
and not memorizable, we created a shortcut for you, which I can't see here at the moment. This one. If you go to this link, ibm.biz business, IBM Cloud Manager with OpenStack, so CMWO, you get to our homepage, so to speak, where we offer our product downloads 90 days for free. So you get the IceHouse release for one now. You get the continuous delivery version of the 4.2 release, which offers you Juno now. Everything I showed you here is done with the preview release, identical code. So if you want to replay that at home in your own premise, be our guest. It's free for everyone for 90 days, free to, tr uh, to use. We have other trials. If you say, you know, I, I really do not have a premise. I don't have much time, but I would like to experiment a little bit with the user interface of the self-service. I wonder how this approval thing works and so on and so on. Uh, we do have a slow network and we have a couple of trials. We have a hosted trial for five days you can get for free. So you get a hosted instance. You can play with the self-service user interface, which has like a mock backend. And we have the other trials, which is basically uh, the, inst the complete install code of our product, which you can apply the fix packs on, and you should, uh, to, to basically experiment on the premise, on the hardware of your choice, with the architecture of your choice to get things going. Uh, and in the same way, the very last one, I want to make the point, you get the version here, which is going to be our product version, but it's basically uh, in our agile development cycle, at the end of each development cycle, we, we publish. Extremely transparent how it's supposed to be. Um, one more thing. Um, well, I think we should keep it simple. Let, let's put it this way. I, I, I welcome you to um, come back to the IBM booth and let's talk about, um, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the um, details that you may be interested in that we don't have time to cover right now because this is a 10-minute overview. Uh, there is a lot more to, to the OpenStack possibilities that you can do, the architecture that you can do, and some of the, the, the patterns uh, that may be interesting to you. I want to mention it was said that this is for local premise only. Remember, this is OpenStack. We do offer hybrid with, with Keystone. Uh, as well with the base building blocks of Cloud Manager with OpenStack. So you can build your, your, your distributed multi-region cloud like I've demoed here yourself. Any questions? I talked to you in the... <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your... Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so here, here's the deal. IBM works as a big IBM team. The IBM Cloud Manager folks and the distributed OpenStack team within IBM produce with the community OpenStack. The Cloud Manager team is packaging that up and creates the product and do the, does the testing and does a lot of work to harden that to make it usable for customers. Um, the Cloud Orchestrator folks use the very assets, the very same RPMs and most of the chef recipes, I believe, as well, uh, and basically uh, build their product out of that. So you, you have a good compatibility because it's really the same binaries they're using. And guess what IBM Cloud OpenStack Services is built from? Same thing. So you're, you're, you're talking about a family of offerings here which really fit well together because they're built from the same components. What I haven't mentioned, which is probably a given, that our deployment server is based on Chef. We do extensive work with the community. There's one sense I would like to stress, we do not fork. Meaning, if we need a change in a community recipe, we propose a patch to the Stackforge project that covers that cookbook. We work with the community till it gets accepted and pull a new version of the cookbook down. So you will not have the situation that the stuff that we're shipping in our product is something which is dramatically different than the community version. Because clearly we sourced it from the community version. We take great pains in that, which is not so much a technical pain, but every time we have to legally approve it. So there is some work involved. <laughs> All right. Sorry for talking so long. <laughs> you want to use that power? Uh, uh, okay. <coughs> so
Hello? OK. Uh, so what I wanted to do is pick up off what Frank was talking about uh, with CM, uh, the CMO product, which was uh, more around you know, what you do on your on-premise. You take your so the CMO software, the distribution, and you put it onto your own premise. What I'm going to be talking to you about is a new offering we just announced last week. It's called IBM Cloud OpenStack Services. Uh, my name is Ashish Patel. I'm the founding product manager for this offering. So what I want to do is I want to spend the next 10 minutes, and I want to make sure I leave time for Scott here uh, to complete our hybrid cloud story here. Um, but I'm going to give you a quick short demo, and I'm going to start out by just telling you about what is this new offering. Okay? And so the reason this picks up off of where Frank left is, like I mentioned, this is on-premise, what Frank was talking about. This is the situation where, you know, you're, as a business, you're considering, well, I need to get an OPEX model. And one thing that I think resonated very well for me uh, at the, uh, the, the keynote two days ago was when there was a panel of people from different companies and they were talking about their pain points around how to manage OpenStack, how to have the right skills in their organization to, to actually manage it and deploy it and scale it and operate it. The whole point of this offering is that it's off-premise. It's hosted with software, any of our software data centers around the world, and IBM will actually manage it for you. So now in this situation, as a business, what you are doing is you're using the power of OpenStack. You get the dashboard, you get the APIs, but you don't have to worry about managing it and scaling it and operating it, right? You now become more focused on your applications and the workloads you're trying to put on top of the cloud. You become more focused on reaching out to your customers. You can also now, you know, you have an option for something that's off-premise. And if you are already using, for example, uh, some of the technologies that Frank talked about on your premise, you get interoperability between them because, hey, you know, the APIs and the interface are standard amongst both of those. So you can start connecting some of your assets that are maybe more, need to be more highly secure on your premise. So interoperability is one piece. The, the operations management is another piece. Um, and, and now you can focus on your applications. The other thing is around speed and agility. You hear this comment all the time, you know, we want to get faster and faster and faster. With this offering, because it's a service offering and we sell it on a monthly subscription basis, you can tell us any time during the month, I want more servers or I want more storage, and we just add it into your exi existing capacity pool, and it'll show up into your dashboard and a dashboard that you're already familiar with. Um, so what, that's what I want to do and take you through this. This particular offering, a couple things I haven't mentioned about it yet, um, you see the details at the bottom here on the landing page here, is that you know, this is purely a private cloud. This is another really big piece of value add that we think resonates very well with our enterprise customers. Not only are you having the option to choose from our 16 global data centers or across the world with our wide footprint um, because it's hosted at software, but all of the hardware is dedicated to you. You don't have to worry about your noisy neighbors. You get predictable performance. You know exactly the hardware spec that's underneath, full transparency <coughs> there. Um, security is now you know, completely under your realm. So you really get to benefit from a lot of that. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is just the management piece. So I said this was managed by IBM. I'm going to show you in a second what is managed. But I just want to emphasize that this is backed by a 99.95% SLA. And uh, let me actually just show you what, what that means and what that covers. Um, so in addition to the SLA, it also includes 24 by 7 support. So this here is just a quick little architectural diagram just to kind of put in context what's behind the scene about what I'm about to show you. So what you can see here is the, in the overall system, um, there's really four components here. There's a management system, which is in the dark blue at the top. And what you get in the service that you pay on a monthly subscription is you get three-way uh, highly available OpenStack controllers. This is, again, fully managed by IBM. You don't have to worry about anything in it. And this actually runs the same distribution that Frank was talking about. So the same consistent experience that you have on your premise, now you have it off-premise. Okay? You also have a secure way of connecting. There's a, a, a VPN and firewall devices. And in fact, there's, they're actually diverse. So we actually segregate out where your customer data traffic will come from versus where IBM will manage the environment from. Enterprises consistently ask us for diverse data paths. And this is, this is our way of providing that. Um, and so lastly, you know, these three pieces here are fully managed by IBM. The other, if you look through across each of these services here, there's compute nodes. We have a block storage service and an object storage service. Again, remember, all the hardware here is dedicated to you. You pick as much as you want, um, and, and IBM will, ma will manage the hardware. And in this case, the compute will actually also manage the hypervisor that sits on top of it. In this case, it's a KVM hypervisor. And the SLA covers everything that IBM manages. So it's not just you know, the, these dark blue uh, management system environments. It's also the hypervisor on the compute compute nodes, for example, as well as our block storage is backed by, it's just a bunch of disks, but it's running Ceph, 
as well as Object Store is also a JBODS and, and it's, it's running uh, Swift there. So IBM will also manage all that piece. You can then just focus on, on your applications above. So that's essentially the layout around the architecture. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, show you this website uh, just so you have some reference after you leave this, uh, this session. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you further. If you hit this URL, open.ibmcloud.com, it'll take you to our landing page. This is publicly accessible on the internet, and all the, everything I'm about to show you from here on is on the internet. Okay? So I just want to be very transparent about that. So the way that you connect into this environment, like I said, there was a secure set of VPN and firewall services, right? Um, so what you can see here is that on my, on my environment here, actually I'll just show you the actual uh, connection information. Uh, I'm, I'm just VPN into my environment. And um, this is, uh, this is uh, we, what we do is when you get the service, we issue you a bunch of certificates, SSL certifi uh, uh, VPN certificates. You can use OpenVPN uh, on any of the platforms and just connect in like I have here. Um, once you do that, you can hit the landing page and you can go to our dashboard. So this is our dashboard. I'm just going to zoom it up a little bit so you can, you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but when you're not connected into the environment, you know, you try to connect to the dashboard, it won't work because you can't connect over the internet. You need to have the VPN uh, connected. So when I connect into the dashboard here, uh, I can choose to embed it into the screen or I can just pop up a new window. I typically like to pop up a new window. What you'll get here is you'll get the Horizon dashboard that you're already used to. It's just skinned with IBM information, our logos and our colors and things like that. Um, and uh, just wait for that to load. And then, okay. So once you're in here, you'll, and you'll know that you're in the service because it'll clearly say IBM Cloud OpenStack Services at the top. Um, you'll see an overview of you know, the typical thing that you're already familiar with. You know, what's your capacity, what's available to you, and so on and so forth. What I want to emphasize here is that not only in this, situ in this service do we take the IBM distribution of OpenStack, but we also have made a number of enhancements on top of that that are only available via the service. Okay? So that's what I want to kind of go through, through, go through right now. Um, let me, I'm just going to, I have some preloaded tabs here with the same access. I just did it while I was logging in here. So what I'm going to show you here is um, around our roles. One of the things we do is we try to give our customers really good defaults. So the two that you just saw me check off here, this is what one of the things that we consider good defaults. Because one of the experiences we've, when we were talking with developers when we were originally formulating the product was, okay, OpenStack's great, but when I install it, I have to do a lot of configuration, things that I would expect the, to be there by default. So when you, if you're familiar with OpenStack, you, you set it up, you get an admin account to it, but that administrator can do anything that they want within the OpenStack environment. So what we've done, and, and Frank, you know, this is also picking up what Frank was talking about, projects and tenants. What we do is we give you a, one cloud admin uh, role. So you can add as many users as you want in here, but this cloud admin, you know, they think of them as your central IT group who's managing your cloud. Okay? Then there's project admins. So just like Frank showed, each tenant you can associate different project administrators there as well. But what you can also do in here, when, when I, if I was to actually go in and show you the policies, is you can actually control how much of your overall capacity on, in this hosted environment is actually available for a particular project. So this kind of helps with capacity of planning, right? If you have an environment, let's say, that can have 500 VMs, you may want to give a project who only needs 100 VMs access to only consume that much amount of capacity. Right? So you can, you can control your administration here. So we think this is, again, like I'm saying, a good default. You can get started just right out of the box once you get access to the environment. Another thing that we've done is, I'm just going to flip to this next tab, is, is around flavors. So one thing that resonated very well with the, with the we, we surveyed like 500 workloads of all different types of industries when we were coming up with this. But what, one of the things that we constantly heard is, I don't understand what tiny means. Like as an operator, you know, if you're familiar with OpenStack, you, you might, right? But when you're working with a lot of variety of workloads in a larger company, tiny, small, medium, extra large, doesn't really resonate that well with the workload that they're ultimately trying to board onto the environment. So what we've done is we created two classes of out-of-the-box flavors that are loaded in here by default. What you see up here from big machine down to the high memory and high CPU in the middle here, these are what we call our specialized workloads. And they're really easy to remember by the name because the first number is basically the number of vCPUs, the second number is the amount of RAM, right? So these are just out-of-the-box defaults. And then we've also created a second category of just standard 
and what we call standard and super, but these are common workloads. So if you're a, you know, a company that runs a lot of VMs you know, for your web workload, you're probably going to use something like this. If you maybe have something more specialized where you're going to run your workloads, you're probably going to pick something uh, at the top set of the list. But the point here is that as good defaults, you get out of the box ready to go. So we've done a lot of configuration there. Last, I want to just kind of show you what we've done in terms of images. Um, so in our model here, you can BYOI or BYOL. Okay? Let me explain what that means. So be, bring your own image is the first piece. So you might see a lot of you know, cryptic names at the top here. So these are just other users are in our environment who have brought their own image in. And this is typically, you know, they, they, in their enterprise, you know, now they're uh, thinking of adopting a private cloud that's hosted somewhere else. So they have imported their images maybe from their existing KVM or their Zen environments or uh, their VMware environments just using standard cloud init. And we give you the full documentation on how to do this. But you can import your own image or what we give you, again, good defaults out of the box from, that you see listed here is we just give you the image. We give you a vanilla image that IBM manages and maintains and patches, keeps up to date, and you get the image. You can provision your VM using the image and br bring your own license in to activate it, and off you go. Okay? So you don't have, you know, again, think about the model where, okay, if I was going to go set up my own open stack, I have to get all my own images and set that all up, and I'm taking a lot of time to do all that. So, so that's been one thing. Th these are the three major things that I like to talk about when I talk about the good, uh, the good um, defaults that we give you around images, flavors, and the rules just out of the box. Uh, one, of, one of the other major things that I just want to touch on, uh, this is probably our next biggest enhancement other than you know, taking software, hardware, and packaging it up as a service and then giving you OpenStack and managing it is uh, what we've done around our network. Okay? So what we've actually done is we've taken our software-defined networking technology and we've integrated it into the OpenStack uh, that's running on this environment. So you don't get this if you're going to go onto your own premise or if you're going to, you know, for example, take an OpenStack distribution. You have to get the hardware. You have to get, go to an SDN partner, get their software, put it on top. You have to integrate it with the network fabric that you have in your data center, test it all, do all the driver work that you have to do there. You have to do a lot of work there, right? So the whole point here is that out of the box, you get our software-defined networking, and we've done all the integration and testing for you in a cloud environment. So as you scale up and you add more and more nodes, um, whether it's compute or storage, it, it just builds on top of that, right? So the whole point here is that you can create now, you know, uh, different lines of network, whether you want to have virtual machines that are accessible on the public network, or what we have done is created a, a network here that's called SL Private, which is if you're already consuming other software services, you can connect into the private network here. Uh, and keep that separate from your other workloads. You can also think of, you know, as an enterprise, each of these network lines being either lines of businesses, projects, or, you know, a tier in your application. It could be the front end, the middle tier, or the back end. So however you want to carve it up. And our software-defined networking can actually allow you to s scale up to thousands and thousands of these, these networks. So, and, you know, this is all out-of-the-box experience. So that's what I want to mention with uh, software-defined networking. The last thing I want to talk about is, and just mention, and I'm going to let Scott talk more about this in more detail, is the example that he's going to show is, is more around our hybrid cloud. So well, I'll let him talk about it in more detail, like I said, but I just want to show you that the instances that are running here, you're going to see this name called trade application. What we've actually done here is we've actually used this hosted environment, this hosted service, as essentially a target of resource. So from your premise, you can actually drive this, you, this hosted environment, you know, because it has API, you can drive it from your on-premise environment. So it just this becomes an extension of your data center now, and you can deploy applications into that environment. I'm going to let Scott take more de detail on that, but just to prove, just to show and prove that when he's going to show you I'm deploying onto this thing called ICOS, this is the actual environment, and these are the actual VMs that got deployed. Okay? So let me just kind of wrap up. Um, a couple more points here is that, again, everything's publicly available. This is our full documentation page. We actually have a dedicated team that helps us write a lot of the tutorials. So if you want to import your own image, it tells you exactly what commands you have to run to run Cloud Init and package up your VM and where to upload it and all these types of details. Uh, so all of our documentation is, is listed on this page. We also have a, a support page as well. So with this service, you get 24 by 7 support via telephone and ticket. And we're obviously enhancing uh, to eventually bring things like live chat and, and other s forms of support as well. Uh, and lastly, you know, we just announced this offering. 
and it's listed on the IBM Marketplace. So if I actually click the Buy Now button, I'll show you just to prove it. It actually just goes to the Marketplace page, um, and, and you, you, could, you could buy it from here. So again, this is a monthly service subscription, uh, and you can scale, you can expand and shrink the environment based on your workload needs. And this is another way to consume our OpenStack service, our OpenStack technology, but now in a service form, right? So when you look at everything and you look at your environment and you look at what I have on-premise and now what I can have off-premise, you know, anywhere in the world with our global footprint, this is the option that we would have there. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up and I'll just pass it on to Scott here uh, to talk about... Uh, Try again. Yeah. One Try again. later. Thank you. So, uh, sorry about the hiccup earlier on. Um, let's see if we can get this working this time. I've rebooted, so hopefully. There we go. So, let me jump straight in here. I know we've got to go quite quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about the IBM Cloud Orchestrator. It's um, just like the other technologies we've heard uh, about, it's built on OpenStack and it uses OpenStack extensively. I'm going to give you just a quick overview of the, the architecture here. At a very high level, then I'm going to jump into demos. I've got two demos, and um, we've only got a very short period of time, so I'm going to go very, very fast. But um, hopefully, if you have questions, please contact me offline or come down to the booth and they'll get, get a hold of me. So, we've got, you can think of the architecture, I usually describe it in being three layers. We have this kind of infrastructure as a service layer, that's OpenStack. I'm not going to talk to you about that because explaining OpenStack to this audience would be. <laughs> would be a futile waste of uh, all of our energy. You know this stuff as well as I do, if not better. We obviously get to our private clouds through OpenStack. We have an extension which lets us get also to the public clouds. As you, as you can see, Amazon soft layer for now. More to come. Moving up into the next layer. Now, you know, this OpenStack allows us to, to provision and configure compute resource, network resource, uh, storage, and so on and so forth. You know, a lot of our customers are, are large enterprise customers that are deploying large business applications, and large business applications don't run on like one VM or on a couple of VMs. I mean, basically, you can describe the business applications as being, you know, a, a topology uh, of a number of different nodes. You probably have some web servers, you know, web application servers, database servers. They're all connecting to each other. They have to talk to each other. They have to scale out. Perhaps they have to be clustered for resilience, high availability. So. Uh, you, you, we, we need to find a way to be able to um, represent a business application in order that our end user can actually just go in and, and um, provision that you know, with one click or you know, with a couple of clicks uh, without having to do all of the time together of the different pieces from the individual elements from down here. And I'm going to show you a demo that um, describes you know, how the patterns work and, and how that relates to the hybrid cloud stuff that we, we just talked about. Going even you know, one level further up, though, I mean, even if you can you can deploy your business application and have it all configured automatically, you know, with a couple of clicks of the button, uh, with you know some of our large enterprise customers, you know, that's only one small piece of deploying a new service. I mean, you still have to do change control. We still have to get the, the approvals. We have to deploy the application, of course. We have to do asset management, maybe update a CMDB. We have to monitor it. We have to make sure it's compliant from license and security point of view. We have to do backup and restore. So the business process part here, the IT business process, includes the deployment of the compute infrastructure. But you know that's it's much more much more complicated uh, than that. So we, we provide also this layer, which allows you to automate the process end to end. So you're not just saving time and resource here or here you're getting across a whole ITIL process or whatever process you happen to use. So let me just describe the demo really quick and then we'll jump into it. Um, we've got three different data centers. We've got one on-premise here in North Carolina, one on-premise run by Cloud Manager with OpenStack that Frank spoke, uh, spoke about earlier. Um, and we've got the, the software the hosted uh, site here. And what we're going to do is, um, as we said earlier, we're going to deploy a day uh, an application, day trade. I mean, for some reason, the example applications always happen to be stock buying applications and so on. But we're going to deploy it in, in a hybrid mode. So we're going to put the, the application server cluster here hosted uh, on our hosted site. And we're going to put the, the database cluster on an on-premise site. Okay. This is a demo. It's actually recorded as well. I didn't. Um, I wasn't able to... 
we didn't want to risk it not working, given that the, 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 the Wi-Fi here was kind of flaky yesterday. So we, we recorded it quickly. So let's see that now. I'm having resolution problems, so I hope that doesn't get in the way of seeing the demo. Okay, so that's just a picture we just saw, and now we're going to dive into the, the, the product itself. Usual login. I don't know why we don't skip this thing in, in our demos. The login piece isn't necessarily that interesting. So here we go. So this is actually an IBM Cloud Orchestrator. As you can see, this is the, 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 the dashboard, the initial page that the user can see. And it's got some metrics about the stuff, you know, the, the resources that that user is actually using at the moment. So the number of VMs, what state they're in, how much memory, how much um, uh, storage, and the CPU, etc. We have a number of different regions. As you saw, we have di different open stacks. And we can actually go in and change and have a look. You see the numbers changing down here as you go in and look at each individual region because the usage will be, will be different in each of those regions, um, clearly. So now we're going to go up and, uh, and actually um, get the service. So this is a self-service catalog, just a, a number of menu items. We want to deploy some cloud services, and specifically, we want to deploy the, the application. So clicking on that, that brings us to, the, to this page. Now, okay, we're, we're associating that, an instance name. We need to have to know how to call the thing. If you look here, we can see the environment. Uh, it's maybe difficult to see, but that asks you where you want to have your database server, whether you want it on-premise or off-premise, and the same with the application server. Um, the application server is on software, as we saw earlier in the diagram. The database uh, server is on-premise on a private cloud. So we requested that the deployment of this um, this application. Let's go and see what's going on. So have a look at the, the, the status of, of the instances that we've created. As you can see up here, we've got the little um, icon telling us that the database server is still deploying. But you know, we have some pieces of the application that have already been deployed. So clicking on that, we can go and see what's, um, what's going on there at the, the application part of the, of the deployment. A bit of information about the, about the application and the number of virtual machines that have been deployed. We see this too. We have some information about you know, the usage. Let's go down. It tells you, you know, the version numbers, all this, the usual stuff you'd expect to see. We copy the IP address so we can go and actually log on to the application and, and, and demonstrate that it's actually working. If we do it now, this is probably the least interesting part. So I'll, I'll actually skip ahead as soon as we get on just because we've, it's an interesting application, but it's probably not. Uh, the most relevant piece of the demo for, for you guys. So the rest of this demo sort of clicks around here a little bit and shows you how you can actually use the application. But let me just jump forward a little bit. There we go. So we talked about the, the patterns. What did the patterns actually look like? I mean, we actually deployed a pattern, but you haven't seen what, what it looks like. Um, th this will sh just show you very, very briefly, because uh, we could spend hours here, but very, very briefly what it would look like to, do, to, to define, to build an application pattern uh, using, using the Cloud Orchestrator product. Um, I'm still missing some of the screen, which is unfortunate. But like I said before, so we've got a, different, a number of different nodes in the topology. Here we have three different nodes. Um, as you can see, it's drag and drop, and you move them about, connect them together, and so on and so forth. Each of the nodes has a scaling policy. Now, scaling policy means if this is a cluster, then you know, when, certain, you know, when the workload gets beyond a certain level, I want to scale it out, increase the number of nodes in the cluster. When the workload falls back down, I can reduce it. If you, when this dialogue disappears, if you look up at the top left-hand corner here, there's a number one to 10, that means you can start with one node and scale up to 10, minimum one, scale up to 10, depending on the, on the, the workload that we see. So CPU, memory, and so on and so forth. One other thing I'd like to mention is the, the stuff we're gonna see over on the left-hand side. Now we need to put automation onto these nodes. So when we add a new node, there's certain automation actions that we need to take. Now these actions are basically over here as assets. These are scripts, it could be Chef or whatever your, fa your favorite um, scripting language is. We just drag them onto the node. So now when we deploy an extra instance of this node or we take it away depending on policy, then you know, this automation will run. And we can just add dragging and dropping like that. We can add um, you know, different assets, different uh, automation um, assets onto each individual node. We do supply a bunch of those assets out of the box. Um, and we also have a, 
an ecosystem that um, we resupply uh, assets on this website, which is the cloud marketplace. We have scripts, we have the patterns themselves, and we even have some of the higher level business process stuff that we'll talk about very, very shortly. And we also want our partners to do that. We have a lot of assets that have been built by, by partners and you know, hopefully also with our customers in the future. The, the idea here is to build up, think about like a, a, an app store that you would access from your phone, but you know, this is for enterprise uh, cloud deployments. So that was the first piece. Remember there was the three pieces in the, the architecture. We you know, had the open stack, we had the pattern stuff, and the hybrid uh, stuff, and we also had the high level business process, IT business process automation. I want to show you what we're doing with the third layer now. This is um, a slightly different tack. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for our customers to be able to um, def define automation. Like I said before, it's not just about provisioning compute resource. We also have to, we have to manage that. So the, the application developers just want to get their machines and get, get to work on them. But you know, the operations guys want to be able to manage them and keep them sec secure and make sure it's compliant and so on. But we have to make it easy for lo those guys to do it. And we have to, make it, we have to do it in such a way that we don't slow down the developers. So this is um, what we're doing at the moment. We're building wizards to allow the, the <laughs> we're building wizards to, to, to allow the, 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 the administrators, the people to build the service offerings to be able to inject management capabilities into the automation without getting in the way of the, uh, the, you know, the application developers. This, we're actually building a, a new service here. So we're giving it a name. It's, it's a, a service to deploy managed middleware we're giving a name, the description, the usual stuff. Then you can choose the category. Now, depending on the category of middleware or application or whatever you want to, to build, the choices, the menu choices and the wizards and the dialogues in the next panes, the next few panels actually change. So we're trying to remove all the clutter and just making, you know, providing the, 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 the choices and the, you know, the decision making only to things which are relevant for that specific goal. We're choosing the type of middleware. In this, situation, this case, we've got a, a DB2 for Linux. We love DB2. Um, and we're choosing the, the deployment options, gold, silver, bronze, and that can mean whatever you want, memory size, CPU size, whatever you like. Um, there's a little checkbox here, which we didn't check. If I check this, then that choice would be hidden from the user when they actually use the offering. Uh, in this case, we've left as a default. We're choosing the management capabilities that we're going to inject automatically. We've chosen backup and restore and monitoring. We've chosen the ability to add additional volumes to the, to, to the, the database server, which, um, which is going to be provisioned. But in this case, we've chosen not to use security compliance. Maybe that's because it's a development system. This is the backup and restore configuration. We have to add some, some parameters in here. In this case, it's the location of the agent, which we're going to automatically install when we provision a system. And by the IP address, so that when it comes up uh, and it gets activated, it connects automatically to the, to the storage backup system uh, and just works out of the box. Um, we have to we, we define a few options, the, the frequency of the backups and you know, what we're actually going to back up. And that just gets set up for the, for the user and that gets uh, configured automatically when we install that agent. Monitoring similarly, we put in the, the location of the monitoring agent. The, the IP address of the server to allow it to connect and just work out of the box. So uh, this is additional volumes. Um, this is a possibility to add a, an additional volume to, to the server. Again, I've, I've not clicked the hide the configuration option, so this will become a default for the, for the user. Um, he can change it if he wants. Down here we have slightly more technical um, Op operations, and we're actually checking this box so that you know the, the administrator puts these in and doesn't allow the user to change them later. That way, he won't do any damage by choosing the wrong option or mm, uh, take a, a more exp expensive option, option than you know what he's allowed to do or, or whatever. So, th so that's it created. I mean, really, in less than five minutes, we've created a brand new um, offering in the service catalog. We've chosen the management options that we want. We've set it up so that it gets automatically configured. Uh, and, and so that the user now, we'll see just in, in a second, we'll go and see what the end user point of view, what the vision of, of, of this is. We're now logging on as the, as the end user. We've got the boring login panel again, which we'll get through real quick, hopefully. And we're almost done. So Judith logs in. 
she's going off now to the self-service catalog. She's going to look for the DB2 option that we just created. And it's in a search field, which is about here. <laughs> but you can't see that it is, we found the DB2 um, entry. This is what we just created. It wasn't there before. She's going to get some options. <coughs> she has to choose an instance name because we need to know what to call it. Here we have the flavor. Remember the gold, silver, and bronze? We, we chose silver as a default, but we chose not to hide it so the user can change it. Judith's got some money this, this month, so she's chosen gold. Um, she wants the better option. And this is the, the volumes. What size do you want? We chose two. We didn't check the option. She's bumping it up to six, but she doesn't see any of the other options whatsoever. They've all been hidden because they've been pre-compiled by the administrator and, and it was chosen to hide them. That's it. I know it was extremely quick, but only 10 minutes. And um, like I say, please get in touch with me or Andrew Trossman <laughs> or come, come down and see us at the booth and, and folks will find me if you want some questions. I'll, I'll be here until Friday morning. Um, or grab me now, whatever you prefer. Thank you very much.